Good evening. Tonight's class is dedicated by David and Ida Schattenstein in the sacred memory of the Mumbai Kedoshim and Rabbi Gabi and Rivka Holtzberg Hashem Yen Kimdomam, as well as in the loving memory of a young soul, Alta Shula Bas Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Swordlov. Class is also dedicated to Langa Yaren in the merit of Levi Yitzchak Ben Cyril for a complete and speedy recovery, and in the merit of Shalom Mardechai Ben Rivka for a speedy Yeshua and salvation. The holiness of unholy thoughts, that is our theme this evening. You know, they tell the story about a guy comes into the psychiatrist's office screaming, hollering, doctor, help me, it's an emergency. The doctor says, calm down and tell me what happened. I can't speak, just help me, save me, I'm going to go insane momentarily. He says, listen, I can't deal this way. You have to sit down on the couch you must gather your thoughts, relax, and tell me everything from the beginning. So the man acquiesces, sits down on the couch, and tells the doctor, in the beginning, I created heaven and earth. We're going to explore tonight a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, you know, was the founder of the Hasidic movement, Hasidism. He was born in the year 1698, or in the Jewish calendar, Tof Nun Ches, on the 18th of Elul. Lived for 62 years, passed away in the year 1760, Tof Kof Chof, on the day of Shavuos. So Shavuos of the year 5770 marks to the 250th yard site, anniversary of the passing of Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. This evening, this class, we want to learn together a powerful Torah teaching of the Baal Shem Tov inside, which like all of his teachings, embodies in many ways the depth, the sophistication, the majesty and the richness which Hasidus revealed in Judaism. This particular teaching of the Baal Shem Tov weaves together three distinct statements in the Talmud and the Gemara and confers upon them a new light, a new depth, which also gives us a new perspective on our, some of our own struggles in life. So let's begin inside. Open up your curriculum right below the video. There is a PDF document. Please open it up so you can follow inside. This is from the book Kesser Shemtov, The Crown of the Good Name, which is one of the volumes that compiles many of the teachings of Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. And this is Simon Lametes, section 39. You could see it in your PDF document. Meha Baal Shem Tov. This comes from the Baal Shem Tov. Shamaiti b'shemori z'chiroinoi levracha l'chayi o'elam haba. I heard this from my teacher. This is transcribed by his student. Be your shas the brachas da flamet gimelamet bays. Omer abzeda kala omer shma shma meshatkin oisai. The Balshemtev explained a statement of the Talmud in Tractate Brachas, page 33b. Rebzeda, the great Talmudic sage, made the following statement. In the Mishnah there in Brachas, the Mishnah says that kala omer moidim moidim meshatkin oisai. If somebody is praying the Amida service and they say moidim moidim, Thank you, thank you, thank you twice. We silence him. 
as Rashi explains, it seems like he's addressing two different deities. He's first thanking one deity and then thanking another deity, so we silence him, we don't tolerate it. Don't say moidim moidim twice. Comes Reb Zayda, and Reb Zayda adds that if you say Shema, Shema, when we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. If somebody says these words twice, Shema, Shema, Reb Zayda says here too, we must silence him. Amar Leirev Papa Labaya. Rabbi pa, Rav Papa asked Abaye, the Talmud continues, Dilma meikara lo yechaven daitecholi. Why do we silence him? Maybe the first time this Jew said Shema, he was not concentrating. And the second time he says it, he wants to concentrate. He wants to have kavana, he wants to have mindfulness. So why would we silence him? Why will we not allow him to say the Shema a second time? Amar lei, Abaya answered Rav Papa, Chavrusa klape Shema yemiike. May you act towards heaven like a friend, with familiarity. When you're talking to your friend, sometimes you concentrate, sometimes you, what we say in Yiddish, yehakachaynik, which literally means you strike a kettle, but Figuratively, it means you speak rubbish, you're not mindful of your words. May one act towards heaven like a chavrusa, like a friend. If the person did not concentrate. Initially, we strike him with the hammer of a smith. Nafche is a smith. Marzafta is the Aramaic word for a hammer. If he doesn't concentrate the first time, we strike him with a smith's hammer. Ad the mechavendaite, till he concentrates. So Abaya rejects completely the notion of Rav Papa, that somebody might want to say Shema twice because the first time they were not mindful of their words. Abaya rejects it and he says, what do you mean they're not mindful? What is God a friend? Before you pray, before you start saying your words, you have to be mindful, you have to concentrate. And if not, we strike the person who's not concentrating with the smith, with the hammersmith. And this concludes the section in the Gemara, Brach Islamat Gimel. Vihiksha, the Baal Shem Tev, once asked the following question. Akati Yakushabim Kaimai Medis. The question of Rav Papa still remains. Mikol makayim. Nonetheless, Dilma meikara lo yechavin. Perhaps initially he did not concentrate. Vahashta ba lotzis yidei shemayim alechavin. And now this Jew wants to fulfill his duty to heaven and concentrate. Abaye is saying, you're treating heaven like a friend. How could you not concentrate the first time? We'll strike you with a hammer smith till you concentrate. But let's be factual. A person is praying, and sometimes he's not concentrating, or she's not mindful of her words. Our minds roam. And as we know, when we pray, our minds can travel the world. When we pray, our minds can take us to very interesting places and accomplish many things. That's the reality. So the Baal Shem Tov is asking, what is Abayah telling Rav Papa? There's no such a thing. God is not a friend. You have to concentrate. If you don't concentrate, we strike you with a hammer smith. But what happens if somebody did not concentrate when they said Shema? And now they want to repeat it in order to say it with the right mindset and the right emotion and the right state of consciousness. Why shouldn't you allow him to say it again? Abayi didn't answer the question. V'oid kasha, another question the Baal Shem Tev asks. Lama nukat Reb Zayda da'afka o'imr shma shma beis pa'amim. V'loi pasak achir b'kriya shma y'kayoytze. Why does Reb Zayda choose the word shma? Why not another verse in shma? He could have chosen the word v'haftas Hashem alakecha. Or any other verse in the shma. In fact, in halacha and shulchan aruch, there's a big discussion among the halachic authorities if when Reb Zayra said Shema, he meant literally those words or that verse, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad, or he includes, and he means all of the verses of Shema, all of the sections of Shema. 
any verse and any word in the entire Shema, Shema, Vahayim, Shemaya, Vahayimer, all the three portions of Shema are all included in this ruling of Reb Zeda. Or he literally meant only Shema, Shema, the verse Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekein Hashem Echad. And many halachic authorities say he meant all the Shema, entire Shema. So Reb Hashem Tev asks, why does Reb Zeda choose these words, Shema, Shema? He could have chosen another verse in Kriya Shema. Or he could have chosen another section in prayer. Just like the Mishnah says, Maidim, Maidim, he could have chosen another section. Why from all sections did he choose Shema? Obiyer, the Baal Shem Tov explained, Mahu inyan kabolos el malcha shamayim. For this we have to understand, what does it mean that a person accepts upon himself the kingdom of heaven, the presence of God, which is essentially what Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad is. When we say Shema Yisrael, it is a consciousness of Kabbalah's El Malcha Shemaim, of the person accepting upon himself or herself the reality of heaven, the kingdom of God. What does this really mean? What it means is that the human being ought to embrace the idea, the belief, that the entire earth is saturated with his presence, lace asar and there's no space conceptually or physically or emotionally or existentially that is devoid of the divine reality. Therefore, comes the Baal Shem Tev and says, since lace asar there's no space devoid of him, so all the thoughts of a human being have within them the reality of God. The divine reality fills every space and therefore saturates and permeates every thought of a human being. And every thought of a human being is a koima shlema, which means a complete structure. A complete organ, uh, a complete organism. A kaima, kaima means the complete height and structure of a human being. Don't think there is such a thing as a fleeting, irrelevant, inconsequential, meaningless thought. Says the Boshem no. Every machshav is a welt. Every thought is a kaima shlema, is a complete structure. The Baal Shem Tev conferred tremendous dignity upon every thought of a human being. Now when a person is in the midst of prayer, trying to connect to his soul, to connect to God, to connect to the soul of existence, and during the prayer, in his thought, comes up a machshav a negative thought, a detrimental, destructive thought, or machshav an alien, extraneous thought. He adam One must know that this thought is coming to the person because it seeks to be fixed, healed, and sublimated. Since God's presence is everywhere, including in every single thought, so this thought too has two layers. The Baal Shem Tev is telling us, you're in the middle of prayer, and some suddenly thoughts start entering your mind. Not only are they not part of the prayer experience, on the contrary, these are thoughts and ideas and notions that are detrimental, that may be actually be evil, destructive, or at least completely alien. This thought has two layers. Externally, its shell, its husk, is detrimental is alien to the prayer experience. Its inner core, its inner identity comes to Baal Shem Tev and says, she came to you so that you should actually sublimate it and heal it and fix it. This thought also has a depth, a purity. God is in this thought too. There's God in this thought. There's holiness in this thought. The holiness may be deeply embedded, deeply concealed, deeply repressed. And this thought came to you so that you should unravel its layers, uncover 
its true, pristine purity, divinity, and majesty. You are the one who must identify the godliness in the thought and therefore heal the thought. Now here, I want to parenthetically make an important observation. This idea of the Baal Shem Tev has become, in, in one, in, in, in a, in, uh, from a particular perspective, this thought of the Baal Shem Tev, idea of the Baal Shem Tev, has become a foundational motif in modern psychoanalysis and psychology. Literally a few days ago, I spoke in Florida to hundreds of addicts, people who uh, have, uh, many people who have destroyed their lives in the killing fields of addiction. And they are all in the process of recovery, some more advanced, some beginners, but entrenched in the recovery process. Somebody asked me a question after the lecture. Why is it that I follow the steps, the 12-step program, I go to meetings, I have a sponsor? These are words, lingo, that are connected to the 12-step program for those who are familiar with it and those who should be familiar with it. I do the program. I follow the steps. I'm in. And yet, I still cannot liberate myself from so many cravings and addictions that seek to destroy me and th always th or often can throw me right back into a relapse. How do I deal with it? So, in response, I was discussing the fact that Sometimes throughout our entire life, there are certain cravings and addictions and appetites we do not get rid of. And that in itself is not bad. The fact that a human being may harbor thoughts that are ugly, destructive, detrimental, even horrific and grotesque, that in itself does not make you a bad person. What you have to do is you have to identify the thought or the emotion or the feeling for what it is and dismiss it calmly from your life. It may come back in a half an hour. It may come back in an hour. As long as you can identify it and not confuse it with an idealistic thought or emotion. As long as you can identify its source and what it represents, you're fine. You're fulfilling your purpose. A woman who was present has been in the program for many, many, many years. And one can see how much work she put into her soul, her sobriety, herself, for many, many years. She was way ahead of the game in this particular field. And she raised her hand and she says, what you're saying is good, but you're missing a fundamental point. And that is that in every addiction, and even in an addiction towards promiscuous relationships, immoral relationships, which is what we were discussing, there's genuine love. But sometimes a person was so injured in life, or so abused in life, or they abused themselves in life so badly, that their language for love is a perverse language. They may not know how to experience and express and yearn and pine for love only through dysfunctional verbiage and actions because their love is an injured love. So their shell, the form of their love, the way it expresses itself may be horrible and destructive, but inside there's real love. You have to be able to identify it. This idea is rooted in this teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. In every thought, a bad thought, an alien thought, God is present. And when you're praying and this thought comes to you, it came to you because it wants to be healed. It wants its true essence to be uncovered. Now let's continue inside. 
Zakh de Balsham to Vim Ene Maimen Baza. And if a person does not believe this, Ainza Kabolas El Malchus Shemayim Shlema. He does not have a relationship with God. In other words, he did not really accept upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven in completeness. Because he's shortening, he's abbreviating God's presence, God's reality. He believes that God exists only in certain places and shortens his infinity the fact that God represents the truth of all reality, the fact that there's an organic oneness that unites all of reality and all of its manifestations at a core level are one. So Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad doesn't only mean according to the Baal Shem Tev, God is the creator of the world and the king of the world who runs the world and controls the world. It means something else. It means Hashem Echad that there is oneness. At the core of all of existence, that every thought is a koima shlema, every thought is a complete divine structure, and there's godliness inside. Now we will understand the true meaning of the statement of Reb in the Talmud and Brach Islam and Gimel. That if somebody says shma shma twice, we silence him. Vikasha, here is the question. Lama Mar Bais Piyamin, why did he say Shema twice? You already said Shema Yisrael. Why are you repeating the words Shema Yisrael or Hashem Alekeinu or Hashem Echad? Why again Hashem Echad? Vitzarech Loimar, we have to assume. Kimei Karel Loichav and Daite. Because the first time the person did not concentrate. The Hainu Shahayu Loyeza Machshav Azara. Apparently, the first time he said Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad. He wasn't concentrating. He was thinking about an alien thought. He was thinking about a fear he has, a struggle he has, an appointment he has, an issue he has, anger he has, this emotion, this problem, this uh, blessing, this virtue, this dilemma, whatever it is, people's minds. Do we know people's daydreams and imaginations? I mean, it's a great, great creation. Imagination, the power of imagination. Machshav is only thinking another thought. So therefore he thought, this wasn't a Shema. When he wakes up from his alien thought, when he finishes it, he's, Oi, I'm saying Shema, and my mind and my thoughts are elsewhere. This is not a Shema. He wants to repeat it. Amnam, however, But if he would have really understood and known, that in that thought that he experienced, which was an alien, extraneous thought, there is also the presence of Hashem. The reality of God, less us, fills and is intimately saturating that thought also. He would know that he doesn't have to say twice Shema, because even the thought that he had when he said the first time Shema is really a Shema. On a deeper level, there's purity there, there's holiness there, there's godliness there, there's love there, there's truth. There, there's idealism there. If this Jew would have understood what Shema Yisrael is, Kabbalah Sel Malchus Shemai, to accept the oneness, the kingdom of God, that everything is filled with God, so then he wouldn't have to say Shema a second time because the first Shema was also a Shema. I, he was thinking about a Machshav he was thinking about something else, but we established that that alien thought came to you because it wants to be healed. It wants you should reveal that it too is a manifestation of God, is a manifestation of love, is a manifestation of truth. Continue in the curriculum, continue in your source sheet. This is the tzachos, the shining, beautiful meaning of the words of the Gemara, machinen marzafta denafch. Abaya tells her, if Papa, if you don't concentrate, we strike him. If somebody doesn't concentrate the first time, we strike him with the hammer of a smith. Obviously, the question is, first of all, who ever heard of the idea that somebody's praying and they're not concentrating the first time, so we come with the smith's hammer and we strike them? Nobody knows what anybody else is thinking. <laughs> God made the person that nobody knows what, you're, what are in your thoughts. 
So how is it even possible we strike him? What does this mean? And why does he use this metaphor? Does he mean that a person has to be rebuked? A person should not do it? Great. But the Balsham Dev asked a great question. You shouldn't do it. But what if you did it? What if you had a relapse? You're praying and you're not mindful. So we'll say, don't do it again. But now I want to say Shema again. The Talmud's answer doesn't look at first glance, it's not answering the question. So the Balsham Dev says, Hakavona, the meaning is. This is not an alien hammer smith. Somebody comes with a hammer and knocks you over your head. It's not what it means. You know this story that once happened that reminds me. You know how it is in some synagogues. The rabbi doesn't get along with the president. And the gabbai doesn't get along with either. So once... There was a shul, and the rabbi would give his long sermons every Saturday morning, Shabbos morning, and the president would sit on top on the stage there, across, across from the rabbi on the other side of the ark. And the moment the rabbi would start delivering his sermon, the president would immediately fall asleep. The gabbai who despised the president comes over to the rabbi one day, and he says, Rabbi, you know this is a disgrace that your own president in public sleeps and snores during your sermons. And the rabbi says, I agree, it's an unheard chutzpah. So the gabbai says, Rabbi, if you only give me permission, this Shabbos, when you get up to speak and the president starts sleeping, I'm going to take a bat and strike him over his head so that he should learn a lesson of respect to the rabbi. The rabbi says, it's a beautiful, beautiful and very great idea. Okay? The rabbi is excited. The gabbai is excited. Shabbos comes. Rabbi gets up to speak. The gabbai prepared his bat. And of course, the president is sl- dazes, dozes off. The gabbai comes over with the bat, strikes the president over his head. The president looks up, sees the gabbai standing right in front of him with a bat or with a smith's hammer. The president turns to the gabbai and says, do it again. The gabbai says, what? Why? president says, I could still hear him. So the Baal Shem Tov wants to understand, what is the meaning of this? The answer is, the thought itself is striking the person. The smith uses a hammer to put things into shape, to fix things up, to make them usable, to make them beautiful. That's what you do with the hammer. The thought itself is striking the person like with a hammer, because the thought, what the Talmud is saying is the thought itself is urging the person, is striking the person, is hitting the person. It wants to be fixed. It wants to be sublimated. When you're experiencing this alien thought, you think it's bothering you. It's striking you. It's, it's, it's driving you mad. You're trying to pray, and this thought is distracting you comes the Baal Shem Tov and says, the Talmud is saying, Abai is telling Rav Papa, this thought is what's striking the person. Because it wants that the person should engage it and not fall prey to its external shallow husk, but to fix it, to sublimate it, to heal it. So why is he repeating Shema a second time? As though the first time when he said Shema, God was not present in that first Shema. He's shortening, he's minimizing God's reality and the acceptance of the true yoke of God's kingdom. Therefore, the Bzeda says, this person has to be silenced. The words of this wise man are charming, are glamorous. So how does the Baal Shem Tov explain the Gemara? This is what Rav Papa and Abaye were talking about. Let's understand the exchange. Rav Papa comes to Abaye and says, why did the Bzeda say that if you say Shema, Shema twice, you should be silenced? Maybe the person wants to repeat it because he wants to concentrate. So Abaya answers, one second. Are we friends with heaven? 
If somebody doesn't concentrate the first time, we strike him with the hammer of a smith until he concentrates. So the Baal Shem Tov asked a great question. Fine, but what if he didn't concentrate? The Baal Shem Tov explains, you don't understand what Abai is saying. Abai is not saying, despite the fact that he didn't concentrate the first time, we don't let him concentrate a second time, say it a second time and concentrate, because he should have concentrated the first time. But what if he didn't? Abai is saying something deeper. The lack of concentration the first time is also kavona. You're telling me he might have not concentrated the first time and that's why he has to do it a second time. So I'm telling you, what do you mean he didn't concentrate the first time? He was thinking about something else. But we hitting him with a hammer of a smith that he should concentrate. The lack of concentration of this machshav is a thought that came to him and is striking him and is bothering him because it wants him to reveal the shema in that thought. So when he, had, when he said Shema the first time with that thought, it was also a Shema Yisrael. It was also a complete experience of Shema Yisrael. Either it was an alien thought, that alien thought just came into him so that he should reveal the godliness in that thought and therefore really fulfill Shema Yisrael. So that alien thought is also part of the divine experience. It's also part of the love. It's also part of the holiness. And that's why it came striking him like a hammer saying... Take me, embrace me, heal me. Now the person disregards it and says, I'm going to say Shema again. Why are you going to say Shema again? The whole point of Shema is that God is one. So God filled also the first thought by saying Shema again. You're delegitimizing the whole idea of Shema. The whole idea of Shema is that there's oneness in the world. The whole idea of Shema is that there's nothing devoid of love and of meaning and of depth and of truth, including the first thought. Your job is to reveal the Shema in the first thought, not to run away from it and reject it and delegitimize it and repeat Shema again as though the first Shema was meaningless and insignificant and inconsequential. So when you're telling me he wants to repeat it because he wants to concentrate because the first time he didn't concentrate, Abai says, what do you mean he didn't concentrate the first time? The lack of concentration the first time, that is the concentration. That is the Shema. The machshav zar, the alien thought, wants to be sublimated. The Baal Shem doesn't explain there what Abaya meant with the words, are we friends with heaven? It may mean, does a person think that he's only a friend with God? He's only a companion, but still somebody else? No, God represents the essence of every person. God fills your entire reality. God is really a term which means the essence of your reality, your own truth. God is at the core of every experience, at the core of every thought. If you would just be a friend with heaven, so I'm talking to a friend, sometimes I concentrate, sometimes I don't concentrate. But since God fills everything, so every thought is saturated with godliness. So even the first Shema was also a Shema. So this answers both questions the Baal Shem Tov asked. Why did Abzeir choose from all the words Shema? Because what he's trying to say is that this is what Shema really means. So it's expressed. When you say Shema twice, it means that your second Shema Yisrael, you don't really get what Shema Yisrael is. And that, of course, explains Abaya's answer to Rav Papa, why even if he didn't concentrate, he should not say Shema once again. Because the first thought was essentially the hammer of the smith striking him, asking him, begging him, nudging him, urging him to be embraced, to be elevated. Alpiza, but this is not it. This is not all of it. There's still another dimension and a major caution that must be established, as we'll see in a moment. Alpiza, beer, shast, b'choydes, dav chesamet beis, and we're going, to be, we're going to come back soon to, there's two aspects here the Baal Shem Tov is saying. We discussed the first component, now the Baal Shem Tov is going to go to the second half of the teaching, which is crucial in order to understand this teaching. And with that, I'm going to go back to the conversation I discussed earlier, I had, I had the privilege last week to have with the addicts, and what that woman spoke about love, injured love. Again, we'll be able to see two dimensions in the process of recovery and all spiritual and psychological growth. 
Alpiza beer shasta pchaydes daf chesamet beis according to this the Bosham to explain a statement in the Gemara Talmud tractate pchaydes eight b. Now this needs a brief introduction. The Gemara in pchaydes daf ches discusses a fascinating story. One of the greatest Talmudic sages who lived at the end of the Second Temple era and after its destruction was Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya was not only a great scholar and personality and sage, he was also a debater unparalleled. And the Talmud describes an intricate debate and a very powerful debate Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya had with Sabi de Bey Asuna, the elders of Athens. Athens, of course, was the intellectual capital of Greece. Greece then was not what Greece is today, if you're following the developments in Greece. Greece was the intellectual capital of the world. The sages of Athens, the students of the great Greek philosophers, and of course the great three of Socrates, of Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, or Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, I should say. And their students and the students of their students were great philosophers and people of the mind. And the impact that Greek philosophy had on civilization was quite well known and recorded. A major debate takes place between one Jewish sage, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya, and the elders of Athens, Sabi de Beasun. What's fascinating is, if you read the Gemara, we have the whole debate, but nothing makes sense. It was all done in riddles. The entire exchange between Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani and the elders of Athens is all in riddles. So we have to decode the riddles and demythologize, decipher what they meant. So many works of great Jewish minds are dedicated to uncover the meanings in these debates between Rabbi Shubach and I and the elders of Athens, because at the surface, these debates, the debates and their exchanges, their dialogues seem childish and immature and ridiculous, absurd. Here is one of those debates, and here is an example of what we're saying. And this is what the Baal Shabbat is going to explain today. They asked, the sages of Athens asked Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya the following question. Ritzutsa demis a chick which dies, Upirish Rashi, a Freyach Shemez Biklipasa. A chick what dies when it's still in the egg. Mehecha Nafik Ruchi. From where does its spirit leave? The egg is completely sealed off. There's no opening. The chick died while it's in the egg. So from where does its spirit leave? Umeshani, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya responded, Mehecha da'ay el nafik. From the same place through which the spirit entered the egg, that's the same place through which it leaves the egg. And Rabbi Yeshua was victorious. Vishazet sarich biur. This story in the Gemara needs explanation. They asked the question. The chick died in the egg. Where does its spirit leave from? So what did Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya answer? Same place where it came in from. Okay, so what's the answer? I'm going to tell you first a beautiful, there's a lot of answers, but I want to tell you a beautiful answer given by the Maharal, Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Yehuda Leva of Prague, 16th century, in his commentary on Gemara, Chidush Agadis, he, he gives two explanations. This is the second one. He says, a chick that dies symbolizes a child who passes away. Like that little chick that was not fully developed. The Greeks believed that children who die are finished. There's nothing that's left. The body rots and there's nothing left. Why? Because according to the Greeks, the only thing that defies mortality is the intellectual in, intellect of a person. It's the seichel, the intellectual contributions and experiences of a person, that is the only thing that remains eternal. A child, according to the Greeks, is not an intellectual. He's not, he or she is incapable of uh, 
relating to abstract intellectual concepts. So therefore, according to the Greeks, this child is gone. The more we are identified with our seichel, the more we are identified with abstract intellectual concepts, that self, that rational self, that intellectual identity becomes immortal. Children have nothing of that. But the Greeks argued even more, even according to the Jews who believe that a person has a soul, unlike the philosophy of the Greeks, in other words, a soul, it's not just the intellect, even the Jews who believe that a person has a soul, the Greeks argued, when can the soul defy immortality only if it's not completely enmeshed with the flesh? A person who was aged, who developed time to think about abstract topics, his soul is divorced somewhat from the flesh. A person who's older, who has detached himself from earthly cravings and instincts, his soul can live after he dies. But a child who's completely focused on bodily needs, what does a child do? A child sleeps, a child eats, a child drinks, all bodily physical needs. So the, the Greeks argued the soul is so enmeshed with the body. If the child dies, if the chick dies, the spirit will never leave. There's no way the spirit can't leave anymore. It's stuck in the egg. So the Greeks believe there's no mort- immortality for a child who dies. It's just over. And certainly, even, and even according to the Jews, there's no immortality. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani answered the Maral said, you don't understand. What secures the immortality of the child is the fact that the same way the spirit came in, the spirit comes out. The soul of a person is pure, is pristine, is divine. And even and it comes from somewhere else. It's a divine reality. So it comes in, even when it comes into the body, it remains pure and holy and sacred. And therefore, even after the person passes away, the soul remains untouchable. The body may die, and the body is interred and buried into the earth. But the soul of a person is essentially a transcendental reality. It's a divine reality. It comes from a different place. It existed before birth. So Rabbi Shul Bechananya says, you're asking, where does it go out from? Same place where it came in from. The whole soul is something beyond. A person, there's a part of a person that's completely beyond the physical, completely beyond the earthly. So even the child who's involved with many physical needs, his soul remains or her soul remains eternal. That's the Maharal's explanation. Now let's see the Baal Shem Tov's explanation in the context of this discussion. Back here in the text, the Moshem Tov explained it based on a Gemara intracted Brachis in chapter Haraya, Dafnun Zayin, the last chapter of Brachis, Dafnun Zayin Amad Aleph, 57a. The Gemara says, Haraya Beitzim Bechaloim, if somebody sees eggs in a dream. The Talmud there is discussing dream interpretation. If you see different symbols, things in a dream, what does it mean? So the Talmud says, if you see eggs in your dream, I guess some people dream about eggs. So it depends. If the eggs are whole, so the shell is intact, so you can't see what's inside. So then the Talmud says, Tluya Bakashasi. It means your prayers are suspended. You're not sure. We're not sure if your prayers will be fulfilled or not be fulfilled. Because just like a closed egg, a sealed egg, you cannot see the food. You're not sure what you don't you don't see what's inside. It's covered. So this represents the fact that you cannot see what is going on with your prayers. But if in your dream you see an egg that was already broken, so you could see the the yolk or the white, the edible food inside, now you know that your request was fulfilled. What do we see? What does this mean? We see that in the Talmudic imagination, the egg represents prayer. Because if not, this whole Talmudic interpretation doesn't make sense. I see an egg in my dream. An egg represents prayer. So the Talmud says there's two types of eggs. If you can't see what's happening inside the egg, you only see the external, uh, external component of the egg, so you don't know what's happening with your prayer. It's suspended. Will it be fulfilled? Will it not? But if the egg is broken... So you have access and you could see the inner edible food. Now you know that your prayers will be fulfilled. 
It's interesting, in the laws of Pesach, it's also discussed that beitza, the word egg in Aramaic, is called beya. In fact, it's a very common term in Jewish literature. We don't say beitza, we often say beya. The word beya, beiz yud ayin hey, has the same etymology like the word boi, which means a request, a prayer. So beitza is connected to prayer, to requests. <laughs> now we'll understand the story in Gemara. There's no thought that does not have a complete structure. There's no thought that does not have meaning. There's no thought that does not have its own unique and important personality. Every thought is a world. Every thought is a universe. And even a negative or destructive or alien thought that comes to a person is coming for him to fix it and to elevate it as discussed. So if the person pushes away the thought from him, it's really like he killed and he pushed away a complete structure, a complete world. If a thought comes into my psyche, to my heart, to my reality, as I'm praying, and I throw it away. So according to the Baal Shem Tev, what did you do? You killed a Kaim Shleim, although it's a thought, not a person. But as he said, every thought is a world. Every thought has God in it. So every thought is meaningful. Every thought has life to it. So when you take the thought and you sublimate it, you heal it, you elevate it, you brought it back to life. You reveal the true life in it. You uncovered the shell and you excavated the soul. But when you dismiss the thought, when you denigrate the thought, when you just let go of the thought, you actually kill the soul. But sometimes there is a thought that you have to push away. Sometimes you have to do it. So let's go back to the egg. There's the imagery here. The egg represents prayer. Sometimes the chick is hatched. The mother chicken sits on the egg, warms it, warms it. And the chick emerges as a new chicken or a new rooster. Comes to life. But sometimes there's a chick that dies in the egg. A little life that dies in the egg. So the Baal Shem Tov says, when I have a thought that's alien and I push it away, what did I do? I'm in the middle of prayer, I pushed away the thought. What did I do? I killed the chick. But sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes there are thoughts you must suspend. And if you ask a question, how will I know which thought should I push away? And which thought should I bring close? You have to follow the following reflection. If the moment the alien thought came into your mind, it came also with a remedy. At that moment, you also had a thought of how to fix it, of how to reveal the love inside of it, of how to reveal the holiness in the unholy thought. If the alien thought came was followed by another thought showing you how to elevate it, then go embrace it, explore its true identity. But if you don't immediately have an instinct in your thought how to fix it, then probably it came simply to confuse you to confuse your mind, to nullify your prayer, to kill your experience, then you have permission to push away the thought. We all know the Talmudic moral dictum, if some, you're not allowed to kill another person. 
But if somebody comes to kill you, you kill him first. If this thought is coming because it wants healing, then you will experience another thought that will help you see how you can heal it. But if the thought is just coming as a thought to disturb you and confuse you, if an instinct comes in that's grotesque, that's perverse, that's alien, that's strange, then if that happens, ah, it's coming to kill you. Even though it's true, you're killing it. You're killing a thought. We said God is there. There's a life there. But if you don't kill it, it will kill you. If you don't kill it because you'll have compassion on the thought, it will destroy you. That is why the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shneir Zaman of Liadi, the founder of Chabad, in his Tanya, chapter 28, he has a line there, a very sharp line. He says, Al lasik balas hamidis. Don't be foolish and think when you're praying, the alien thought comes into you, you're, oh, you're going to sublimate it and heal it and fix it. You have to be careful. You have to be cautious. I want to give a metaphor, an illustration to explain this distinction the Baal is making. There was once in a museum in an art gallery a beautiful, tremendous piece of art of a dog, a big and strong dog barking, its teeth bulging, and the image on its face was frightening. And as a real good art, it looked vivid and real. And whoever came into the art gallery and saw it, most people, when they saw the piece of art, what they do? They jumped away in fear. They didn't want to get bit by this wild, undomesticated dog. It took a great artist to be able to come in and look at it and see it as a piece of art. I go back now to my discussion, our discussion with the addicts last week. She asked me, she said a good question. She asked, she raised a great point. Isn't all addiction about love? Isn't, just, isn't it just injured love? Isn't it true that the manifestation may be perverse? But inside there's love. Yes, there's two stages in life. One we call subjugation, one we call transformation. When you see that painting, you're not always capable of seeing it as a piece of art. It's true, every destructive addiction and alien thought and perverse reaction and immoral craving and appetite and proclivity and instinct and habit, inside there is love, inside there is holiness, inside there is godliness. It's a piece of art. But are you even capable of seeing the piece of art? If you engage it, you may simply be morally defeated and fall prey to promiscuous, destructive, and immoral actions. What you have to do is you have to push it away. Because that thought that's coming to you may be a product of your own issues and your own addiction, and you are still bound in that place. You're still bound up to your patterns. You're still not fully wholesome and developed that you can actually objectively Look at that instinct, look at that thought and say, wow, see the art. At this stage, you must identify it and reject it. There is a deeper stage of consciousness where you can transform it, where you could see the art in every thought, in every word, in every emotion. Not in its external expression, but in its the depth, and you can heal it. This now is the meaning in the story of the Talmud. Now let's continue. You now will understand what the Gemara means. A chick that dies, from where does its spirit go out? When you have a thought in the middle of prayer, prayer is called an egg. In the middle of prayer, you have an alien or destructive thought. 
that's the chick that's in the egg. The miss, the chick dies. You push away the thought and you kill it. It has a soul. It has divine energy in it. But what did you do? You killed the chick in the egg. On this day ask, how does its spirit go out? It's not a geographical question from where does its spirit go out. It's an ideological question. Uh, means how does the spirit go out? How do you have the audacity? How do you have the courage? How do you have the chutzpah? How do you have the cruelty? To kill the spirit, to remove its spirit, to push away a world, a universe, by dismissing and denigrating and ignoring these unholy thoughts, Shani on this Rabbi Yishob and Chananya answers, I can remove the spirit based on the place where it came from. Just as the thought came in in order to confuse the person and push away the person from his own relationship with God, so the same, the spirit can go out. The person has permission to push away the thought and to remove it and to kill it. That's what he means from the same place that when in it goes out. They ask the question, how can you dismiss such a thought? How can you kill such a thought? How can you ignore and destroy and obliterate such an opportunity? How do you do such a thing? How do you remove its spirit? You have to indulge it. You have to engage it. You have to sublimate it. So he says, no. Look at where it came from. Where did it come from? What was its motivation? Its motivation was to destroy the person. To stop your davening. To undermine your concentration. To pull you away from a healthy and wholesome and mindful state in a relationship with your soul. That's what its point is. If that's what its point is, if you're going to engage it, if you're going to recognize it, if you're going to acknowledge it, you will not be able to recognize its true deep art. You will rather fall prey to its external manifestations and it will succeed what it wanted to do. You're still in a place where you're not detached from it. You're too much part of it. And you don't have the luxury, you don't have the serenity, you don't have the depth, you don't have the discipline to be able to see yourself as completely distanced from this thought and from this perverse experience and say, let me heal it, let me fix it. If I engage it, what will happen is I will become a victim of it. Does it have a life? Does it have a spiritual life? Yes. Are you always ready to reveal that spiritual life? Not yes, not yet. Maybe later. Maybe after the prayers you can go revisit it. Maybe at a later stage. But right now, you have to kill it. Based on where it came from, that's how it goes out. If it came because it just wanted to be healed, if it came like this hammersmith begging and asking for redemption, for healing, if it came because it wants to serve you, it wants you should help it become what it really is, then sublimate it, then elevate it, then transform it. But if that's not the case, if it did not come for healing, if it came because it wants to destroy you, that's where it's at. Now you have no choice, but you have to disengage yourself from it. You have to dismiss it so that you should be able to be in a position where you continue to serve God and you continue to access your sobriety, and you continue to cultivate a real relationship with your soul during this unique gift and opportunity of prayer. And he concludes, The words of a wise man are glamorous. Have a good night. Mm-hmm.